Welcome back to the Knock On Sports and joining me in studio. And I feel bad for this because I had to cancel him last week because I got food poisoning. But we got him back here on a Friday and we're talking the NFL. We're talking the Seattle Seahawks. It is Brandon Schultz from the Seahawkers podcast. Brandon, great to talk to you again, man. Yeah, you're kind of letting me down down the stretch of the season. I, we had all these great weeks of Seahawks football and we've talked one time. <laughs> Well, I, I I promise the rest of the season, the rest of December into January, we will be fine. Okay. And you know what's even more important, too, is that you know as long as the Seahawks take care of business, which against the San Francisco 49ers and two weeks ago, what we saw is any indication, we're going to be talking playoff football. So I'll get to make this up to you. Yeah. Well, this is lining up perfectly, right? I mean, the Seahawks are 8-5. and five. They're in position to get to the playoffs. Over the next three games, two of those games are against teams – that are in competition for the number one draft pick. Mm-hmm. I'd say it's looking pretty good. Oh, yeah, I would say so. Two of the um, games are at home. Now, one of the games is against the Chiefs. They're a pretty good team. Well, speaking of that, I mean, do you, I mean, granted, the Chiefs are next week. Do you, do you feel like, all right, the Chiefs are beatable after watching what happened last night? Hey, Andy Reid down the stretch going into the playoffs. You know, you know what they say about Andy Reid in the big games. Yeah, that's true. That's true. How let me put it even more this way: getting a win. And I know we're we're jumping way too far ahead here, but we're looking at our crystal ball. Oh no, this works out perfectly because you know we were we the the Chiefs game just happened, so this is really topical. If the if, I think if the Seahawks were to grab a, a big win over Kansas City next week because uh-huh. that game is at home, I think you guys start looking like the Eagles to a degree from a season ago, or that that team that gets into the wild card that has that run going that can make that run to the Super Bowl. That's the way it looks like. Uh, to me, if you can, if you guys can grab that, because there's always got to be a big win there somewhere or some big moment there that gives that team that confidence, and I think that would be it for you guys. Yeah, although every time we seemingly get a big win, it seems like it's completely downplayed in the media because you know what was it when we beat the Packers? Oh, you know now the Packers aren't any good anymore. You know, <laughs> and then they fire their coach, and well, okay, well, well then we beat Carolina, and who were undefeated at home, yeah. and and the, oh well, Carolina stinks now, and. The, <laughs> Well, the thing is, is that apparently in the media, these teams stink before you play them, but then once they get no, that confirmed... No, they're awesome when we, before we play them, and then after we play them, they stink. So it's <laughs> it's really weird, like with the Vikings, you know, they're, oh, you know, here they are coming in, you know, they're the the two top teams going for the playoffs. Well, you know, Kirk Cousins was terrible, they just could they, they didn't even know how to attack that Seahawks defense, he had a bad night. And all the excuses, Bobby Wagner, you know, illegally blocks a field goal. If that would have gone in, you know, the the Vikings would have been a good position to win. The the only reason I would be I'm upset about that Bobby Wagner thing is because back in 2003, Simeon Rice got hit with a penalty for that when we tried and we, we this is the Monday night game where the Bucks gave up 28 points to Peyton Manning and the Indianapolis Colts. Simeon Rice gets penalized 15 yards for. That penalty, uh-huh. and so they get to re-kick after Vanner Jack misses it wide right, and then we lose the game and it cancels oh. our season. So I'm upset about that. <laughs> it totally brings back, different. It brings back those bad memories for you. Exactly. But other than that, why no, do I agree we accept you. this from officiating in the NFL? Why do we want to make illegal awesome plays? That was well, an awesome play when Bobby <laughs> Wagner and Cam Chancellor did it years ago. Those were awesome plays. Brandon, we have an entire hour. We could do an entire hour on that fact and that particular topic alone. Okay. Because guess what? Look at it. How long did it take the NFL to finally just stop with the, the celebration uh, penalties and all that stuff and just let the guys have some fun with it? And then now how many people are having fun with it? The Seahawks have a, a cool little thing that they do oh, every yeah. time they score, like the Sherman tip drill a couple weeks ago. Yeah, it's really fun, right? I, yeah. I've enjoyed it ever since they decided to, to bring back those celebrations. Why take fun things out of the game and penalize them? I just wish one of the fun things I'd like to see come back is being physical with wide receivers. I'd like to see that come back. That, that was fun. <laughs> I thought so. As a I defensive guy, I like that. Um, let's get back to the real point of the conversation. Let's get uh, your thoughts on the Vikings win. 21-7, to obviously. But that game was really close. 6 nothing. What stood out to you that was more impressive? The fact that, that you, the Seahawks win with Russell Wilson only throwing 72 yards or that defense in some of their goal line stands? The the defense was definitely what stood out to me. And Bobby Wagner had an amazing game. You know, penalty, uh, you know, whether that should or shouldn't have been a penalty on the field goal block, it doesn't matter. He had an amazing game that game. He's been doing it all year. And uh, Frank Clark as well. So, and and Shaquille Griffin. You know, the corner had one of his best games, you know, going up, going up against the tandem of Diggs and Thielen. Mm-hmm. I had my worries going into that game. 
because that I felt like that was the weakness that the Vikings would try to attack. And yet they seemed, you know, I think it's Zimmer. I think Zimmer really wants to try and run the ball and get away from, and, and we saw him fire the offensive coordinator over it, apparently. When the Vikings got into those third and short situations, they were throwing the ball mm-hmm. for whatever reason. And I think that's probably what did in uh, D. Filippo. But it was the Seahawks defense, too, that was that was stymieing them all game in the run game. How do you, I mean, you talked about it. You, you were worried. You had your concerns about that secondary. But uh, now so through, especially this four-game winning streak, uh, you guys have played some impressive quarterbacks. You've played some impressive wide receiving tandems. I mean, Earl Thomas isn't back there. We haven't talked about Earl Thomas in quite some time. Bradley McDougal's getting a lot of love right now. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about this secondary and, the, and how well they're performing without Earl? It's coming together, and we had kind of that expectation of young guys being in there. It was going to be a little bit of a struggle early on this season, and I think as as fans, we were expecting Griffin to show a little bit more growth this year, Mm -hmm. which he's been more up and down and inconsistent than I think a lot of us hoped, but the the combination of Bradley McDougal and Tedrick Thompson, uh, apart from some tackling issues from Thompson, has been a pretty good tandem this year. So we could be happy with that. All this defense really needed to do was be average and have Russell Wilson continue to be Russell Wilson. And he did have his struggles in this game. You know, you mentioned his 70 passing yards. At the end of the game, it didn't feel like it was under 100 yards. I was surprised right. <laughs> to look at the stat sheet and go, oh, geez, he didn't even throw for 100 yards. But uh, there were a couple penalties downfield that, you know, with Tyler Lockett, he's been pretty good at. Uh, either initiating contact or he he had uh I think he sold a penalty pretty well in <laughs> in that game against the Vikings which got him into field goal position at one point but then Russell also did it on the ground right yeah. he he's the one that got him into the position for their first touchdown of the game go 40 yards around the edge you know escaping all those defensive linemen trying to run him down and then Chris Carson able to punch it in so I was I was really happy with the way the run game went between Wilson and Penny and Chris Carson Going back a couple of weeks ago, I asked you what team, and compared to teams past, does this compare to for you? And I think we said, what was it, the 2012 Seahawks? Yeah, the 2012, yeah. 2012 Seahawks. Does that still resonate with you now a couple of weeks later? It does, but it's a little bit different because in 2012, it was the Seahawks defense where you looked at the defense and go and, and you said, okay, here's a Super Bowl caliber defense. And that's why going into 2013, so many Seahawks fans were excited because, you know, and even going into 2012, if you remember that that was the year that they, they signed Matt Flynn mm-hmm. and drafted Russell Wilson. And there was a big debate, you know, do you draft, do you play Russell Wilson as the rookie or do you go with kind of an established guy like Matt Flynn? And, even halfway through that 2012 season, it was a question of whether or not Russell Wilson would be kind of that guy to take over. You have similar questions with the Seahawks defense because you you know the offense is kind of the one that's set now. Mm-hmm. And going into the seasons, that, that, that's where we put our hopes. So it, it feels like 2012, but it's flipped a little bit because there's so much youth on the defensive side of the ball and you're kind of counting on them to grow into those positions that were left vacant by Richard Sherman and Earl Thomas and Cam Chancellor. My feature guest is Brandon Schultz from the Seahawkers podcast. As we are talking about Seahawks football, they are eight and five. Uh, a win this weekend gets them into the playoffs. And uh, you know, thinking about that too, Brandon. You know, you go back beforehand. Obviously, Seahawks fans optimistic, thinking playoffs. But everybody was dogging the Seahawks. Thought, all right, this is going to be a, a rebuilding year. Mm-hmm. Thought you guys might be picking inside the top ten. Being here in, in this four game win streak, and, 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 and as well, what's been the most impressive part for for you? The fact that they've been able to create turnovers. And that's one of the things that really kept this team from doing well these past few years is the turnovers that they were creating in those 2012, 2013, 2014 years weren't there. And the defense now is kind of turning into more of a, a ball hawking type defense than it had been in past years. And one of the things that we, we've talked about recently on the show uh, between uh, Adam and I is that there's been some tackling issues. But they've also had the turnover issues. So is is there something that they're doing to turn the ball over more that's making them have issues at, at tackling? Right. And are you willing to accept that? Because if they're able to score points as a defense and, and turn the ball over and get the uh, short field to the offense, you know, I'll, t- I'll kind of take having tackling issues if they can continue to create turnovers like they have been. 
Yeah, I would I would say so. I'd say right now, and, and that's the funny part about it too, because I thought even in 2013 with your guys' defense, if you even didn't have turnovers, that defense was still feared and you could still force a lot of punts and things of that nature. And I think the way the NFL, the elite defenses in the NFL right now are the defenses – that get turnovers. I don't think it's the defenses that can just stop you anymore because I don't think the rules allow a defense right. to just stop you, you know, after you gain 20 or 30 yards on offense. So I think that's the, I think that's really the only way to be an elite defense in the NFL right now is, is you have to get turnovers. Yeah. And we saw that kind of play out in that game between the Rams and the Chiefs, right? It mm-hmm. was the, it was the Rams team that created all the turnovers that allowed, that really allowed them to win that game against the Chiefs. Uh, Brandon, uh, Frank Clark made a comment this week, um, obviously with the 49ers coming up this week, you got Richard Sherman, and you guys go down to Santa Clara. He made the comment that the Richard Sherman era is over. Now, essentially, considering the fact Richard Sherman's no longer on the team, that usually kind of bodes and says, okay, yeah, the era is over. But yeah. what do you think about the comments? Well, he was responding to the fact that Richard Sherman had called the Seahawks a middle-of-the-road team. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, That's true. And so he was he's responding to that. It's, I mean, it is over. And as Seahawks fans, I think we recognized that as soon as Earl Thomas went out earlier this year, that, okay, who's left? It's Bobby Wagner, and K.J. Wright hasn't even played a whole lot this year either. So and he's not wrong. Frank Clark was right to say, that, you know, the Sherman era is over. And mm-hmm. the interesting thing was is that uh, some of the other things that Clark talked about was the fact that he, when he came to the team, it was after that Super Bowl loss, and just that he could kind of feel the, you know, the heaviness that was still kind of hanging over the team after that loss. And now he says, hey, all that's gone. All that's gone now that Sherman's gone and, and Earl's gone. And and so they don't have that that baggage really anymore. No, that's that's, 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 that's interesting. I didn't think about that either because, uh, you know, that does alleviate a locker room if all that is gone. Right. And, and I, I really like Richard Sherman. No, again, it's and, not a slight on him. Yeah. And I'm always going to be a Richard Sherman fan. Mm-hmm. But I think that when you looked at some of those things that, I mean, he got upset when the Seahawks were throwing on a on the goal line and you know it was 2 years later yeah, it was just last year so obviously he was having a hard time I don't think go still that let moment. it go I don't think so either I well it's <laughs> as a as a fan as Seahawks fans we're all going to have to live with that oh yeah that mo it's going to it's just going to be there always and forever yeah, I mean that's it, just like as a Bucks fan, I have to live with Owen twenty seven for my entire yeah. fandom. And I totally understand. Just uh, a, you got to embrace it. Exactly, it's you got to embrace part embrace of who you are it. now. Exactly. Along with that, Brandon, uh, I want to get your thoughts with this. As the San Francisco 49ers, uh, you guys handled them the first time around. They did get a big win over Denver, which was a shock to me at least. Do you feel like at all this will be a trap game, or do you expect much of what we saw a couple of weeks ago happen again? I'm a little bit concerned in the fact that the 49ers haven't quit. And you kind of think of, of, for, of a team that's kind of going for one of the top picks, you kind of expect them to quit a little and not play nearly as hard. Mm-hmm. But uh, George Kittle, <laughs> yeah. that dude, apparently, I, the thing that I don't understand, when you're Denver and you have a pretty good defense, how do you not cover George Kittle? Like, How does that dude get out for 200 yards? He's the one dude... You could maybe argue Dante Pettis, as the rookie, you know, speedy receiver for the 49ers. He's pretty good. But George Kittle's the one guy you have to worry about. I was going to say, I, I don't remember the last wide receiver for San Francisco that I actually had to worry about. I think I might have to go back to the T.O. days. <laughs> I don't think they've had a wide receiver that's been that good. Otherwise, it's been tight ends. Vernon yeah, Davis and sure. George Kittle. But other than that, they have not had offensive Antoine weapons. Bolden, yeah, a little uh, bit. But and, that was like... Anquan Bolden, I don't think, was was very good after he left Arizona because I, 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 he was the old man. I don't yeah. I don't know if that was quite <laughs> Anquan Bolden that was there, but I agree with you there. Yeah, and I think that George kills the guy, so make sure that he's covered. You know, you put two guys on him, play zone defense everywhere else, and you know, you, how do? That's how you stop him. <laughs> I was about to say, Brandon, just say it. It's, it's not hard. Stop George Kittle. You stop San Francisco. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, I agree. It's I said, That's going to be the key. And then uh, defensively, you, you have any worries about the 49ers defense uh, stopping the run? Because they had trouble with that the last time. Chris Carson had a day. Or it was a penny that had a day that day. I think they, they both had a little bit of a day. I'd like to see them 
rest Carson a little bit more going in toward the playoffs down the stretch and, okay. and run Punny a lot more toward the edges. And, just and you know, you can get him up in the middle. And you also have uh, J.D. McKissick back now, too. I would try and rest Carson a little bit going down the stretch. Have him ready for the playoffs and, and where you have that, where you can start really start pounding teams. Absolutely. Uh, and then, Brandon, my final question for you. I want to. I really want to get your thoughts on this. MVP of this team, I know we've got a couple weeks left, so it's still three weeks left, and then we could still find somebody else that could be it. But for you, aside from Russell Wilson, that could easily be the MVP of the team. Oh, who's I, think, the, I thought you were going to say aside from Michael Dixon, our amazing rookie punter. Oh, but, okay. no. no. <laughs> he could be it. We he, haven't talked he, about him in a while. I was about to say, we haven't <laughs> talked special teams in a long time. That's a good thing, by the way. Who's the MVP of this team outside of Russell Wilson? Bobby Wagner has been amazing, and he's a guy that would be getting a lot of run for Defensive Player of the Year. If not for Aaron Donald, <laughs> Aaron yeah, Donald I know. have an amazing season for the Rams. And uh, it, but I think that if you're gonna if you're gonna vote for a guy behind Aaron Donald, that Bobby Wagner would be that number two guy. 105 tackles this year, mm-hmm. no missed tackles. Wow, how incredible is that? That is incredible for a middle linebacker. And Luke Keekley's had like 10, and that's not that's that's a low number. <laughs> I was about to say. Ten still for an entire season over what? How many games are we in? 14, yeah. 15? Yeah, we're, we're pretty Week deep 15. in the season. Yeah, Week so 15, fi- so 14 games. Yeah. 15 games in. That's that's still pretty impressive. Yeah. <laughs> None, though. That's damn near impossible. Okay, we played 13, but yeah, the, uh, three more left. Yeah. Um, also, too, you know, I, and I want to finish this up and we'll t- stop here. But here's the thing with Aaron Donald. I, I'm actually not a big Aaron Donald fan. Everyone loves and craves over this guy and how dominant he is. No, no disagreement. He's got he gets plenty of sacks, but how can he be this dominant? But that defense still gives up that many points. Well, that would be my case against him being MVP. You can't have the MVP of the league be on a defense that gives up thirty points every week. Yeah, that makes like, no sense. The Rams' defense has all these first round picks, but it has not lived up to this vaunting defense. The offense is more recognizable than that defense. Yeah. That Rams' defense does not strike fear into me. All right, yeah, if I was an offensive guard and I know I had to go against Aaron Donald every day, yeah, I probably would wet myself. But <laughs> right. outside of that, that's it. He's having a great defensive season. That's why I'd, I'd say for defensive player of the year, but certainly not MVP. Not with, I'd give it to Todd Gurley uh, if you're going to give it to somebody on the Rams because that's the guy that's, that allows you to score as many points as you do. And there's no way, no, there's nobody beating Patrick Mahomes. I'm sorry, he's what got 45 touchdown passes already. I don't know, people. Now that now that they lost to the <laughs> to the Chargers, now isn't it is it the week to talk about uh, Chargers quarterback? To, oh, Philip Rivers. Yeah, Philip Rivers. Shouldn't we be talking him as MVP now? Uh, I got to look at his numbers. I don't know if his numbers will put him up in there. Doesn't MVP matter. He's, he's the hot. He's the hot hand now. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. This is true. My feature guest, Brandon Schultz from the Seahawkers podcast. Brandon, if they want to catch the latest episode of the podcast, how can they do it? Check us out, seahawkerspodcast.com. You can find us on YouTube or on Spotify. Brandon, always a pleasure to have you on the show, man, and a great talk to you again. Looking forward to doing it again next week. Thanks, Anthony. Go Hawks!